Good afternoon and welcome to our public panel on infrastructure development in the Indo-Pacific. This panel takes place under the 2019 cross Strait series, a partnership with the TECRO Taipei Economic and Culture Representative Office, TECRO, that is examining a broader, um, broad security and economic issues impacting the strategic landscape in the Indo-Pacific. My name is Mia No. I'm the director of the Asia Security Initiative here at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Here, um, here in the Scowcroft Center, we work to honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embody his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security support for U.S. leadership in cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship to the next generation of leaders. I think today's topic touches upon many of these issues, and we're thankful to be conducting this event with such an excellent panel of speakers. The Indo-Pacific is at the heart of an increasingly intense race to forge inter- and intra-regional connections through infrastructure. As China marks six years since its announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative, the United States, along with its regional allies and partners, continue to pursue their own project and investment as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy and under new principles for quality infrastructure as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Taiwan um, um, strategy at, at this year's G20 summit. Taiwan, for its part, um, has undertaken efforts to work alongside the U.S. institutions like the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, as part of a broader effort to support the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. As strategic competition between the United States and China intensifies, where the regional infrastructure project into the changing strategic environment of the Indo-Pacific? Are infrastructure efforts inherently competitive or are there opportunities for strategic cooperation as well? How can Taiwan and other like-minded countries and partners be incorporated into ongoing efforts to provide quality infrastructure in the region? As a reminder, this event uh, will be webcast live and on the record. Please join the conversation on Twitter at AC Scorecroft Center and hashtag ACAsia. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to take this time to introduce the panelists who are able to join us today. To my left, we have um, Ms. Verinda Fike, the Regional Director of South and South Asia, Southeast Asia at the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Next, we have Dr. Robert Donner, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic Analysis and Senior Asia Advisor at the Department, U.S. Department Department of the Treasury, and a senior fellow um, with the Asia Security Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. Finally, we have Mr. Riley Walters, policy analyst for Asia Economies and Technology at the Heritage Foundation. I'd like to begin our panel with initial remarks for each of our panelists for um, roughly seven to 10 minutes. And we'll starting with Ms. Mike for her insight and insights U.S. infrastructure initiative and Indo-Pacific. Um, Verinda, could you please share your views on U.S. efforts on building infrastructure and connectivity in the Indo-Pacific? And what is the current status since Secretary Pompeo announced the U.S. plans on infrastructure last year, July? Mm -hmm. And maybe could you share your experience um, about infrastructure project preparation activities and public-private partnership in the region. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be here mm -hmm. at the Atlantic Council. So thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm very delighted to be with you all um, to talk about USTDA's program in the Indo-Pacific region as well as broader US government uh, approaches to the region. I'm especially excited to be here because um, I'm happy to announce that we're actually going to be doubling our impact in the region, both through the number of projects that we're funding as well as our physical footprint in the region and staffing up more in the region. And this is part of a uh, broader Indo-Pacific vision, as many of you have heard, and the initiatives that um, I will speak to as well. Um, but I wanna just 
kind of rewind a little bit and talk about my own personal connection to the Indo-Pacific region, which actually starts about 50 years ago, um, a little bit before I was born, um, when my mother was actually uh, stationed in the southern Vietnam at the height of the Vietnam War, working alongside an American physician where she administered about 175,000 vaccinations to underprivileged children. Growing up in Kansas and Colorado, I used to love hearing her stories of walking from village to village in her dilapidated sandals and how she would often go many months before she had any contact with anyone back home in the U.S. It seemed very exotic and exciting. So when I first had the chance to visit southern Vietnam, now about 20 years ago, I was really excited to see these same images. And if any of you have traveled to Asia in the last 20 years, it's not exactly the same picture. Um, any of the dilapidated sandals are replaced by the latest and greatest and the trendy footwear. Um, the communications infrastructure is such as that it's the tiniest cell phones I'd ever seen with every one of them having an international plan. Um, and certainly the small huts have been replaced by some of the most stunning architecture I have seen. And I say this because, um, as we know, the case in Vietnam is not really unique to that country itself, um, but it's really astonishing what the Indo-Pacific has achieved in the last 20 to 30 years, where leapfrogging technology is an everyday occurrence. And um, it's something that we need to applaud and recognize. At the same time, we know that the need for infrastructure development continues to be very great. The Asian Development Bank estimates that it's going to take about $1.7 trillion a year to meet the Indo-Pacific infrastructure needs in the region. So this is a, a, an issue that the U.S. government has recognized and has committed more resources to. And if one of the ways that the U.S. government has done this is through the three initiatives that were launched last July at the Indo-Pacific Business Forum. Some of you have heard of these initiatives, but they're focused on digital connectivity and cybersecurity, focused on infrastructure, as well as on energy through Asia Edge. At the same time, we at USTDA have been prioritizing the sectors of infrastructure, transportation, telecommunications, and energy. And now when I go to Vietnam, my conversations are much more advanced, where we talk about smart city development. We're talking to their civil aviation authority about how to help them achieve category one status so they can fly directly to the United States, which they have done over the last year, which is really amazing. We talked to them about an, a $1 billion investment in southern Vietnam to help um, increase LNG imports from the United States. And all of this um, is helping our partners in the region, but it's also helping U.S. companies. So everything that U.S. TDA does is in direct partnership with U.S. companies. So we're creating opportunities for them as well. And we're pretty good at it. Um, actually, just today, we were able to announce new numbers, uh, taking a look at back at what we've accomplished over the last 10 years. And for every $1 of our investment, we have $111 back in US exports of goods and services. And it really takes coming in at these critical early stages where we're able to support feasibility studies, technical assistance, whatever gap funding might be needed to move a project to a bankable sta status. When I talk to the Asian Development Bank or other financiers, that's one of the number one reasons that they give, is that there is financing, there's money available in the region to finance good projects. The problem is finding bankable projects. And that's exactly where USTDA's tools come into play. And I, we're, we don't stop just there. Um, so USTDA also partners with academic institutions such as MIT, or here in, in DC, George Washington University, to train procurement officials of how to look at best value over lowest cost. As many of you are aware, a lot of these countries um, and their procurement officials are forced to look at the lowest cost and are oftentimes frightened to choose anything that may be better quality because it's more expensive. So through these training programs, we're actually training them to look at best value, how to look at life cycle cost analysis. So you're not paying for the infrastructure twice over a period of 20 years, but you're able to recognize that this is infrastructure that is built to last. So we're also working with um, other U.S. government agencies to help level the playing field. I will say I've been at USCDA for the last 10 years. I've been in government longer than that. 
And I think it's really amazing to see the lev this level of cooperation among agencies. Many of you have heard of the new Development Finance Corporation that will become um, active later this month, hopefully. Um, and that was built out of the BUILD Act, which um, authorized OPIC, um, which will become the new DFC, to offer uh, equity financing for the first time and to double their investments in their region um, for $60 billion. Um, we know that other US government agencies, such as USAID and Commerce, um, are all playing a part to provide matchmaking opportunities, to provide more investment in the areas of energy, ICT, um, as well as transportation. And a lot of these efforts are going to be announced um, at the upcoming Indo-Pacific Business Forum, which is the second annual one. The first one was last year, uh, where Secretary Pompeo announced these three new initiatives. Um, it's now been a little over a year, and on the sidelines of the ASEAN meetings in the East Asia Summit, in Bangkok, there will be an Indo-Pacific Business Forum where um, the, the highest levels among the US government will be there to demonstrate what we've been able to achieve over the last year working across agencies. Um, it's been really fantastic to see the Infrastructure Transaction Advisory Network, or ITAN, um, which is really pinpointing key infrastructure projects in the Indo-Pacific region and allowing US government agencies to come with our available tools and to work more strategically of how we can go after opportunities and also um, create avenues for US firms to have access to those infrastructure opportunities. Um, we are also very pleased, as I mentioned, we'll be doubling our impact. And I think part of USTDA's success, um, I mean, certainly is due to our track record of finding uh, opportunities for mutual benefit where we're helping our partner countries as well as creating opportunities for U.S. firms. But this has been uh, something that the U.S. State Department has recognized. And we are an independent agency. We're small, um, but nimble and quick. Um, and the State Department has agreed to double our efforts. Um, so we're actually getting uh, a significant uh, additional funds from the State Department that will allow us to staff up and to fund more projects in the region. Um, I may stop there, um, but I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Um, again, I think that the, the opportunities are there, and I think we'll hear a little bit about the challenges in the region, which certainly there are many. But I think um, in terms of what the U.S. government has to offer, um, leveling the playing field for U.S. firms, focusing on quality, and focusing on how to make the Indo-Pacific free and open for everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And now I would like to turn to Dr. Donor. Um, Bob, I would like to ask the maybe same question to you, but from a different viewpoint about the current status of the US effort on infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific. What are the difficulties that United States has indirectly funding infrastructure? And are there limitations on private sector participation in infrastructure investment in your views? Yep. Well, thanks, Mian, and I want to thank <laughs> Tech Row and the Atlantic Council for the opportunity to be here. Uh, while I was at Treasury, I struggled to craft an effective U.S. response to Asian demands for financing infrastructure. Uh, one thing that made this difficult was that the U.S. Congress attitude towards financing uh, for U.S. or MDB financing of infrastructure investment infrastructure projects sort of ranged between deeply ambivalent to openly hostile. And the reason for that is that building and financing infrastructure is hard and it's controversial. Uh, in the early post-war decades, the 50s through say the 1970s, uh, the US, particularly the World Bank, lent in large amounts to fund project development projects in a variety of less developed countries. Um, there were large cost overruns. Often there was corruption and often there were failed projects. Um, these were loans from governments to governments and uh, in many cases the, uh, the outcomes were unsatisfactory. In addition, there were secondary consequences. There was quite a bit of environmental damage from large infrastructure projects. Um, and also community disruption, population relocation, uh, consequences that spawned a whole group of non-governmental organizations that were actively involved in 
uh, lobbying on infrastructure finance. Um, as a result of this experience, there was a shift of emphasis in U.S. foreign aid away from infrastructure financing and towards basic human needs, institutional development, community development, uh, democratization. Uh, in addition, the United States and other donors put a lot of pressure on the multilateral development banks to uh, take into account governance, uh, environmental and social consequences, debt sustainability uh, in their infrastructure lending. These are all good things. And the United States in particular also put a lot of pressure on procedural and compliance requirements for MDB lending. The consequence of all of this is that it became a much harder and more time consuming to get projects through the World Bank and get them funded. And this created a window for China with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and for also the Belt and Road Initiative to provide infrastructure financing to countries that had found it difficult to deal either with the multilaterals or with the private markets. Um, the China's infrastructure lending, uh, I think primarily now through the Belt and Road Initiative, there isn't a great deal of transparency or good data, but something like $50 billion a year a few years ago, probably a bit less today. Uh, it's a commercial program. It's designed in part to give China a way to get a higher yield on their foreign exchange assets. And it's also designed in part to employ Chinese construction firms and Chinese investment capacity as demand at home in China diminishes. It's not concessional. Um, BRI lending is probably about what countries could get from the World Bank or other MDBs if they went through all the hoops necessary for MDB lending. Um, China appears to be lending fairly indiscriminately to a lot of countries with low and high credit quality, uh, some with, with uh, near debt distress conditions. Countries like Pakistan, Venezuela, Argentina, Sri Lanka. And China seems poised to repeat the mistakes made by the United States and the MDBs in the 1950s and the 1970s. Uh, there'll certainly be failed projects. There'll be projects that have to be restructured and debt that ultimately has to be forgiven. So the question is, what should be the US response? Certainly, the United States cannot match China dollar for dollar. And certainly, we don't want to match China mistake for mistake. Um, a central part of the US strategy towards infrastructure finance is to try to involve the private sector as a source of finance. And in fact, this is the holy grail of US infrastructure policy development. Uh, and for various reasons. The first, most obvious, is the desire to use their money because we don't have much ourselves. Um, the second is that there's, in fact, a huge pool of funds, perhaps $100 trillion in pension funds, in sovereign wealth funds, funds that would have a natural home in infrastructure investment, long-term, high-return assets, uh, if the investment opportunities can be created. And finally, the reason why private sector financing of infrastructure is so attractive is if we can design the contracts cleverly and if we can align the incentives, there's a good possibility of getting effective provision of infrastructure services efficiently and at low cost. But it's a big if. Uh, when the discussion comes to this point, you'll often hear the phrase shortage of bankable projects. And there are a lot of components within the bankable project uh, term. One is the design of effective, efficient programs, much of which TDA is and Verinda are involved in. Um, but there's also how to capture and parcel out the inherent risks involved in um, 
uh, involved in infrastructure finance. Uh, there's exchange rate risk. There's political and regulatory risk, which probably ought to be borne by the governments. There's technical risk that ought to be borne by the private investors. Um, there's problems of sharing and parceling out r risks among those who have appetite for different exposures, particularly over for an asset that has a 40 to 50 year horizon. And so there are a lot of financial engineering questions, almost like the development of risk tranches that would be parceled out to different investors. Um, and finally, there's issues of scaling and uh, securitization that would provide a relatively low cost way of making infrastructure investment opportunities available to a variety of investors without having to go through the process of, of investment development. Um, for all of these reasons, private investment, while very attractive, has been quite limited so far, and it's been very expensive. Uh, something like two-thirds of the private investment in infrastructure has been limited to upper middle income countries, countries like China, Brazil, Turkey. 98% of it has been limited to middle income countries, lower or upper middle income countries, very little, almost none to the poorest countries. And the investment has been almost entirely directed towards transport, I'm sorry, towards energy and telecommunications. Uh, urban infrastructure has been, been notably absent. So in order to, to crowd in private investment, to get success in this area, it's going to require the technical and financial expertise from a lot of players with experimentation to determine what works over a period of of years to get it right and, and to scale it up. So how do we react to China in the short term? Um, and here I have various observations and I'll stop for discussion. Uh, not everything that China does is bad and not everything that China does requires a reaction. Um, furthermore, dependency on China is a phrase that's thrown around far too casually without any real definition of what the dependence means and if it's a serious issue. Um, for the Belt and Road, for other Chinese infrastructure investments, it's important that we define what it is that we care about and what it is that we worry about. Uh, the experience so far has thrown up ports and it particularly the possibility that ports would be open to military use as one clear area of concern, but that's only a small part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Telecoms, maybe. Um, uh, standards, maybe in telecoms, probably not in other areas. Um, debt dependency, surely, but that's an issue that cuts both ways for the developing country. And, and for China. Um, China will get the early wins in this process. The ribbon cuttings, the things that, that attract so much attention. But over time, the difficulties of projects will roll in. And in fact, they've already begun to appear in certain cases. And China has had to react, and actually has reacted pretty well and adroitly to redesigning or at least being open to redesign the, the Belt and Road process. I think the United States and its partners should focus on encouraging well-designed projects that produce infrastructure services efficiently and at low cost. Um, we should press China in the same directions. And we also should concentrate on efforts that provide resiliency and alternatives to the borrowing countries particularly in periods of debt distress. So we should press China to join the, the Paris Club and to uh, go through sort of established uh, methods of debt restructuring and debt relief. 
The last thing that I'll mention, and it's probably a le it's a lesson for us more than a reaction to China. What's happened is that the less developed countries now have alternatives. They have choices. And the Belt and Road Re Initiative, the Asian Infrastructure in Investment Bank, moved into this open space. So for a f an effective infrastructure investment financing strategy, uh, the United States U.S. partners should become more client focused. Uh, not everything that's done needs to be the best. Um, there may well be investments that are cheap and good enough, and U.S. and ally or partner policy should respond and take that fact into account. Um, thank you very much, Bob. Finally, um, I would like to turn to Mr. Riley Walters. Uh, Riley, with the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, the President Tsai has emphasized opportunities for Taiwan to contribute to the Indo-Pacific strategy. You have also advocated for U.S. strengthening its relationship with Taiwan as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy in, in your recent articles and speaking engagement. So what are the, in your view, what are the most real, realistic, concrete ways that U.S. and Taiwan and also um, other like-minded countries can make this happen? Sure. So, is this on? Can you hear me? Let me make sure this, there we go, all right. So we're, uh, we're talking about <coughs> new ways to boost infrastructure development in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so a good way to do this would be by boosting U.S. cooperation with countries uh, that are actually in the region, like Taiwan. Um, these areas would not only be, uh, have a better understanding, of course, of the regional environment, but they're also more likely to continue doing regular business in the region year after year. And not just through investment, but through trading, trading goods and training services. And so if we're looking for partners in the Indo-Pacific region, um, of course, an easy answer would be to look at the partners uh, that are not already a part of the quadrilateral uh, consultations or quad dialogue, which tends to focus more on security issues. And so these countries uh, are Japan, Australia, and India. Uh, the cooperation with these countries is essentially uh, already pretty good, um, even though India itself is still a developing country uh, and ha can be limited in the amount of capital that it can move around the region, um, but it wants to. So Prime Minister Modi's administration has their look or act east policy to engage more with Southeast Asia, uh, but even then Indian investment in Southeast Asia uh, can be insignificant in relative terms, relative terms. Um, and so India it actually has its own limitations on its own infrastructure. For example, uh, officials that I've met with say, you know, India wants to take advantage of the moving supply chains that are happening because of ongoing U.S.-China tensions right now, but uh, is finding it increasingly difficult given the, their capacity issues. Uh, meanwhile, though, of course, the United States historically does uh, have a good investment position already in, in, in Asia. Um, if we look at uh, foreign direct investment into members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, uh, U.S. is actually usually number two, right behind the European Union. Japan is actually number three. And so in uh, 2017, the U.S. and Japan invested a combined $41 billion in ASEAN, uh, or roughly one-third of all FDI into ASEAN. And it's pretty much the, the same for U.S.-Japan investment uh, outside of ASEAN, ac across Asia. Um, Japan has been a pretty aggressive uh, investment mechanism uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia uh, for road, rail, and port developments over the last several years. But even then, the Japanese, I think, would suggest that investment isn't zero sum. So there's a lot of area of cooperation. So it makes sense in 2017 when the United States uh, OPEC signed a cooperation agreement with Japan's version of OPEC, the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, to invest more in emerging markets, uh, like those you'd find across the Indo-Pacific. Um, surprisingly, Australia isn't as big an investor in ASEAN as you might think. Um, between 2010 and 2018, Australia invested a total of roughly 22 billion in ASEAN, 
just under what the U.S. invested uh, in the year 2017 alone. Uh, but Australia does have invested interest in various Pacific islands, which gives it a, a, a strategic um, uh, advantage over the United States. So, of course, Australia is an essential part of the Trump administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, and engagement will continue between the two. But outside of those, so beyond the Quad, I mean, who else is there? And so uh, there's at least one country in Asia that uh, has directly invested uh, in ASEAN over the last 10 years as much as Australia has, and so that's Taiwan. Taiwan is sometimes referred to as the gateway to Southeast Asia, given its location between Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, in 2016, actually, <coughs> the uh, Tsai administration uh, launched its new southbound policy, a policy to economically and culturally engage more with, the, uh, with 18 specific countries in Asia Pacific. And so Taiwanese investment in Asia has riven, risen during that time in particular uh, investments in Vietnam and Singapore. And so to date, Taiwan has invested roughly a total of 97 billion in those new southbound countries. South, uh, Taiwan's new southbound policy has a lot of potential to overlap with the United States' Indo-Pacific strategy. The Indo-Pacific strategy of the Trump administration focuses on free, fair, reciprocal trade based on open investment, transparency agreements, and connectivity. The new southbound policy focuses on promoting economic collaboration, building talent, and building relationships. See some similarities there? So last year, when the, uh, while the Trump administration was still publicly framing out its, its Indo-Pacific strategy, it made sense that Taiwanese officials were looking at ways to better integrate both the Taiwan and U.S. initiatives. So earlier this year, in fact, uh, acting president and CEO of OPIC, uh, uh, Dan Bohegan traveled to Taiwan. And so it was there he met with his counterparts at the Taiwan International Cooperation and Development Fund, as well as President Tsai to talk about ways of greater, greater cooperation between the U.S. and, and Taiwan. Um, my only hesitation there is that <coughs> um, OPIC and Taiwan uh, International Cooperation Development Fund cooperation may only actually uh, prioritize development in the few countries that recognize Taiwan as a diplomatic ally and not necessarily those within the Indo-Pacific. So that being said, um, the, there is importance of working with Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's reflected throughout uh, high-level official speeches and the Indo-Pacific strategy itself. Uh, if you look at the report uh, released by the Department of Defense, it recognizes the importance of democracies like Taiwan in the world and their, rel and their reliability and helping realize a free and Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. And so the U.S. and Taiwan can and, and should continue to engage in areas of finance growth in the Indo-Pacific, developing e-commerce and data governance, infrastructure and energy development, which happen to be, of course, the four priorities for the Indo-Pacific business forum that'll take place in Thailand uh, next month. So there's plenty of room to work together uh, in international development. So all that being said, the U.S. can and, and should engage more with Taiwan um, economically uh, in these areas, but it, it should also engage more with Taiwan bilaterally. So when we think of trade investment uh, and, and just infrastructure investment as well, a lot of these, these are inherently intertwined. So when we talk about infrastructure development, we're also talking about building new opportunities for trade. Um, but trade uh, and, and Taiwan, at least when it comes to Taiwan, Taiwan's finding itself increasingly left out of regional trade deals, like the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, mostly because CPTPP members are potentially afraid of angering China because Taiwan tends to be a, a sensitive issue for them. Uh, but perhaps if the U.S. and Taiwan can pursue its own free trade agreement, uh, and encourage other countries, uh, members of CPTPP, like uh, Canada and Japan, to invite Taiwan into CPTPP as well. This could help facilitate U.S. and Taiwanese in, uh, investment cooperation throughout Southeast Asia uh, and the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, the U.S., as a way to get to that, of course, the U.S. and Taiwan can establish a high-level economic dialogue, much like uh, the U.S. and Japan, uh, Japan had. Uh, a couple years ago before its own free trade agreement began. 
And during these dialogues, it can focus on things like smart cities and e-commerce uh, development, uh, bridging more the US and Taiwanese development banks and things like that. So uh, just like members of the Quad, uh, Taiwan has the potential to become an important partner for international development in the Indo-Pacific. It's just getting there. That's a little bit of a challenge these days, but it, it's possible and, and should be encouraged more. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, all the panelists, for your um, in very insightful opening remarks. I actually would like to go back to um, the initial questions that I raised in my um, initial remarks um, on basically where do regional infrastructure project into this changing strategic environment or architecture in the Indo-Pacific, and then, and then would you view that infrastructure effort inherently competitive or there is a room for strategic cooperation as well? And then we heard that um, all of you have just touch up, touched upon, um, I mean, in a different degree. And maybe I could mention briefly that I just got back from Asia and then there's a, um, it's, it was a sort of Asian Davos forum, and then um, I um, spoke on the panel on the U.S.-Asia strategy, and then mostly talking about the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. And then the question that I got from the panelists and then floor was that um, they're still struggling to understand the concept of U.S. Indo-Pacific, and then is it, is it really the same with the, the concept of Japan? And, and my answer um, to them was it is a still development evolving concept and um, and then but then we have to really talk about um, this vision is and then and then like Bob mentioned um, is directly favoring India and then disfavor China and then is it a question to countries and we're talking about Southeast Asia and then um, and then making a choice between the United States and China this kind of fundamental questions and, um, and maybe I could um, um, rephrase, Farinda, you talk about the level, level playing field. And um, so could you, uh, all of you could talk a little, more, little bit more about whether this strategic competition and cooperation would be possible at the same time. And, and, and maybe from your viewpoint, you said that um, you're work directly working with US companies, which is private sector. But then in the region, when we're, uh, we're talking about, in many cases, state-owned enterprises, and which is a different market system and, and, and structure. And Bob, and you mentioned that um, it, uh, it, it would be very useful to define clearly where the areas for potential collaboration and cooperation work or, or strategic competition. And then, and you also mentioned, um, um, Riley, about the, I mean, about the making a choice between the two countries and then, and then perfect example of Taiwan, but then looking at other countries, I think um, the situation is a little different. So if you could talk, if we could talk a little bit more about this competition, strategic competition and cooperation, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll just touch on the mm -hmm. strategic cooperation because mm -hmm. I do see just the opportunities and the pie is big enough for everybody to have mm -hmm. a role to play mm -hmm. and everyone has their own comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, Riley mentioned Australia. We just signed an MOU when um, Prime Minister Morrison was here a couple of weeks ago to partner with them on the Pacific Islands because that is their comparative advantage, as you mentioned. Um, and they have strengths there that we want to capitalize on. We also recognize that there are U.S. companies that offer innovative, you know, battery storage solutions for islands that would be really relevant and really help the infrastructure, while at the same time increasing trade to those regions. So, as that is a new market that we're going on to, um, you know, partnering with Australia in a strategic cooperation makes sense. We've li likewise cooperated with Japan to focus on this idea of quality infrastructure of how to best to define quality, how to uh, promote um, quality infrastructure. And you know, sometimes it may be the, the cheapest option that might be most needed, but other times, you know, I think these countries want options, and I think it's great. I mean, we're a big fan of competition here in the US, um, and when we talk to our partners, it's great that they have this number of players at the table, that they can choose the solution and the partner that works best for them. 
So um, where do we face strategic competition and, and what possibilities do we have for, <laughs> for cooperation? Um, let me do strategic competition first. Um, one clear thing that's come out of, of Chinese lending experience over the last few years is the possibility that commercial assets that are created become strategic assets, uh, get transferred from commercial to military strategic uh, with Chinese access in the event of debt distress. Um, the case of the port in Djibouti is probably the clearest case. Uh, the port in Sri Lanka at Hambantota is, is a possible case. Um, some kind of agreement or awareness on the part of the borrowing, the contracting company, country, of the consequences for distress, uh, debt distress, and the uh, strategic implications um, um, is, is one clearly important issue. I've toyed with the idea of the offer simply to buy out the loan. If we are really, in fact, that worried about the port, I don't think I'm quite there yet, but it's an idea that I'm turning over in my mind. Um, strategic competition comes, I think, from the possibility of lock-in, if lock-in matters. And I think defining where lock-in matters is, is a difficult uh, question. Maybe in telecommunications, given the possibilities for interception of, of communications, or the, the development of, of global standards that may in fact be competing. Um, but also there's a certain amount of intergovernmental competition, simply because the scale of the Chinese efforts have demanded a response from the United States and from its partners. Sort of the Chinese are doing this, what are you doing in the region? And having worked in government, there's always a demand, a, a need to take credit for some activities, some events. Um, that being said, there are, as, as Verinda has mentioned, uh, lots of opportunities co for cooperation. I mean, the needs for infrastructure are vast. Uh, the Chinese clearly want to be in this space and have the funding to participate. And the Chinese program, the Belt and Road Initiative, is still in the process of becoming and seems both um, adaptable to criticism and also potentially influential, and we should we should try to do that. Um, finally, if we end up successfully tapping private sector investment, there are going to be a lot of players, a lot of components, and certainly having Chinese participate in some of those components would be valuable to the borrowers, valuable to to China and to us all. So I, I think um, much like uh, we, we talk about Chinese investment in the United States, Chinese investment in the Indo-Pacific isn't necessarily abjectly just uh, rejected or, or is, should be rejected either. Um, obviously, it's, it's indicative of just sorting out the good from the bad. And so I think uh, you know, we've, we've heard reports of the State Department doing this, these efforts to actually engage with some local governments uh, across these areas to make sure that you know the contracts that you sign for these infrastructure projects are legitimate that they're not just you know they, they don't lead you to a debt trap or you know basically negotiate negotiate away some of potentially uh, strategic interests um, but that being said you know um, yes there's there's a lot of areas where I think there, there's opportunities for everyone um, it's not just the United States, it's, it's China, it's Taiwan's new southbound policy, it's India's look east policy, it's, it's South Korea's southbound policy, or uh, uh, go south policy. It's, everyone's looking to Southeast Asia nowadays. And so there is a lot of room for competition, a uh, lot of room for cooperation as well. Um, and it's, it's not just, um, it's not just uh, 
competition. It is cooperation. So there, there is that. Um, one thing I'll note, though, is you know we have to also take the factor that it's not it's not the U.S. and China competing for some just uh, vague concept. There are also the local governments as well, and the decisions that they make that take into factor. Mm -hmm. And so these vary across, not just within countries, but across countries as well. Uh, and so it, it varies depending on, you know, you have various levels of corruption, various levels of already sort of tacit feelings toward one nation or the other. Uh, and so that has a, a, a plays a factor into all these decisions as well. Um, and just, I, I'll have to note, um, economics is just a big part of this as well. I think a lot of the things that we, we, we kind of talk about looks a little bit more into the, the political, the IR field, right? Uh, strategic gaming. But economics plays a big part of this as well. And so I think one thing that you'll, you'll probably notice is for 2018, uh, a lot of US foreign direct investment actually left Asia, left the world because of the tax, jobs and, uh, tax Cut and Jobs Act. A lot of US investment was repatriated back into the United States. Not, not to say that that's necessarily a bad thing, right? But just if we're looking at numbers, we shouldn't focus on just one year. We should look at the trends. And the, the trend, as I, I hopefully mentioned earlier, is that the US is already a huge investor in, in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Um, before we open up um, the floor, maybe um, I, I can ask one more question on digital connectivity. I know that we're talking about mainly hard infrastructure, but then, as you mentioned, Secretary Pompeo, one of his three initiatives on digital connectivity, and then China's recent announcement, Digital Silk Road, and I believe that this technology is the field where um, we can see more clear, I mean, clear uh, competition, strategic competition between the two countries, and then has a more um, secu national security implication in, in all the countries in the region. Maybe, um, so I'd like to hear your views, all of you, and maybe, Verinda, to you, maybe you could talk about one or two examples of, um, of your bankable project or, or any, any project you could introduce to us. And then, Bob, would you find more difficulties uh, when, um, when, when we run the project in terms of telecommunications or IT, ICT or digital connectivity? And then maybe same question to Riley. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're finding in the mm -hmm. digi digital space is mm -hmm. that it, it is now cross-cutting every yes. single sector that we work mm -hmm. in. So if you're talking about transportation, we're looking at intelligent transportation systems, emergency communications. Um, you know, certainly we're working a lot on cybersecurity, mm -hmm. which again is an area really where U.S. companies are highly competitive. Um, so we are lucky to have, I mean, Silicon Valley and all, all of the excellent firms there. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as sort of one of the pioneers, I think, in this space, the U.S. has really looked to for quality, for security, for safety. We're known for a lot of those characteristics that makes um, those companies highly competitive, I think, in the markets that we're working. So we expect, um, again, Secretary Pompeo announced this digital connectivity and cybersecurity partnership. This is a very robust um, interagency uh, collaboration across a number of US government agencies that are thinking critically about this and also looking to industry to provide guidance to us in terms of where support is most needed, um, how the US government, I think especially when you're talking about cybersecurity or some more national security issues, having the US government involved is very helpful. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an area where we're, we'll likely continue to see a trajectory of, of growth in the future. Thank you. Bob? So let me try the, uh, the digital connectivity question. I'm an economist. I'm not a, a, um, an ICT specialist. But it strikes me that the things that people worry about, about the digitization of the infrastructure system, is spying, intimidation and general security uh, and spying yes that's a concern it's a concern for for any any country including the United States and including China and others um, and it departs 
in part depends on the systems that you buy, but it also depends on practice and systems development and hardening and the separation of systems into secure and insecure systems. Um, intimidation, I think, is, is more difficult uh, and maybe more limited. Um, people think about what the Russians did to the Ukrainian electric system uh, several years ago. But the question is, can you do that more than once? Uh, you know, after you've, you've pulled the trigger, can you pull the trigger again? After you've threatened once, what are the consequences for your influence and for the choices that the country makes? It may be a, a real threat that is far less serious than, than we think or worry about. And the, and the last thing is general security, um, which is a problem for digitized ICT infrastructure and other systems generally. Um, and it will be, it is, it will be increasingly necessary to incorporate security, have a greater appreciation of security in the design and deployment of systems. And that depends on wherever you buy the systems from, whether they're US systems, Nordic systems, Korean systems, or, or Chinese systems. So mm -hmm. I think, so there's a natural trade-off between price and security. Um, for developing countries, they tend to lean more toward price because it's better to have the system than with, with lower standards than just not have the system at all and not potentially yeah. compete, yeah. right? Lose that opportunity, those opportunities. And so that can be a, a real challenge sometimes, um, especially when you start talking about infrastructure development, right? So, you know, we have these concerns even here in the United States, you know, what happens when we start implementing autonomous vehicles and then those get hacked and that becomes a problem. But so that, that translates across countries. That's, that's country neutral, really. Um, and I, I think we, we, we'll see a lot of those hurdles in, in a lot of these developing countries. Um, another issue, of course, is just the, the personal security, too. Um, again, it's, it's not new. It's not necessarily country specific. Um, but when you have people who are being introduced to new technologies, it's, it's harder to kind of protect yourself because you might not always know what's at risk. Uh, and so. While we should be pursuing the newest technologies and ways to lift a lot of countries out of, uh, out of poverty and uh, looking for ways to um, expand productivity, uh, smart cities is the right way. Problem is, when it comes to more digital issues, there's, there's new different hurdles that maybe not everyone understands, or at least traditional infrastructure is not reflective in, in these new types of development. So it can be tough. Um, Working with Taiwan is a great opportunity on this, I think, because they've gone through a lot of these transitions already, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like the United States where we've sort of been more or less developed for the past 100 years. Taiwan went through this development and is still going through the development um, toward a more digital uh, sort of, a, they want to become the Silicon Valley of Asia, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of emphasis on smart city development and, and uh, automation and not just transporting that technology and that know-how through their southbound policy into Southeast Asia, but also bringing those folks to Taiwan to train them how to be more aware of the cybersecurity concerns, which you know Taiwan has a lot of cybersecurity concerns when it comes to China, um, but also just sort of the development throughout uh, just the implementation of these, of these new technologies. Thank you. Um, great, and now I'd like to Take questions from the floor. The gentleman in the back, please. Uh, my name is Don Kirk. I've spent quite a lot of time in Asia. I noticed an absence of uh, comparisons, say, between how you approach Pakistan versus India versus the Philippines, three very different places. Uh, you mentioned the, some of these ports that where China is working. You didn't mention Guador. Uh, and a corollary question was there was almost no comment on Japan's international I think it's called JICA, their International Cooperation Agency, and what they're doing and how they tie their loans, it would seem, directly to Japanese business and industry. 
uh, may, maybe I'm exaggerating on that, but maybe you could, I think you know a lot more about it than I do, so maybe you could comment on those issues. So if I could real quick, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, we have to understand that there's, there's another side of this, right? It's, it's not just the U.S. and China. It's the countries that are actually accepting these developments. And so when you compare Pakistan and, and India, uh, these are two different countries, uh, and the relationship that they have with India and China, or sorry, the United States and China is very different, right? And so uh, Pakistan is much more friendlier with China than China is with India. Uh, same thing with the United States. There's some complications there. So obviously there's, there's just differences in like the local economies and how these are different. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you pointed out some things that, uh, that could have been in the presentation and, and, uh, and were left out, but, but good things. I think Pakistan is going to be an interesting case study for China because China's investment, BRI investment in Pakistan is large. And um, Pakistan is a challenging country and uh, I think will turn out to be so for, for China as well. Uh, the Gwadar port, as you mentioned, is, is one thing, the potentially strategic implications that, that certainly the United States will look at. Um, Japan is active in infrastructure initiatives in the region. In fact, the whole Indo-Pacific strategy is essentially a Japanese initiative that was adopted by uh, the United States. Um, and Japan has for several years offered a quality infrastructure program, in their term, as an alternative to Chinese lending. It's a more expensive, uh, at least upfront more expensive program than, uh, than China's, possibly uh, with a lower adjusted cost over the whole horizon. Uh, the tide aid, tide procurement point that you made is, is an interesting point. It was certainly a characteristic of Japanese loans uh, for a long period of time. That's no longer the case. I, I know at, at Treasury when I was there, we, we pushed very hard uh, on Japanese tide aid, uh, ultimately successfully. Uh, procurement practices, both for the MDBs but also for the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, are important issues and it's part of what China will be pressured on um, as they, they, um, they go forward because Chinese lending has generally involved procurement from China as well as the, um, the assignment of Chinese teams to actually build the infrastructure project. Don't know. Okay, thank you. We might just actually we know Japan. We don't know subways. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that, no. So maybe take two questions from these gentlemen, and then, and please identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> David Painter. I'm a independent uh, development finance advisor. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, to follow up on this question of strategic, of, uh, strategic cooperation uh, within, uh, within Asia, between the U.S. and Asian uh, countries in the context of infrastructure in third countries. And in particular, I would um, like if anybody could comment on the potential for the U.S. to cooperate with Korea, South Korea. Yep. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weinchop. I'm a retired member of the, of the Foreign Service of the United States. Although the, the event is labeled infrastructure, the three big themes I heard by the speakers was infrastructure and trade and investment. In, in light of these big themes, I'd like to ask if anyone on the panel can tell me what was the gain for the United States of withdrawing from the TPP? I just don't get it. What, what did we gain from it? Uh, so, I, you want me to, uh, so I, I remember the first question about, um, uh, 
possibilities for cooperation in the region. Um, certainly in infrastructure, uh, equipment infrastructure procurement, Korea is an important supplier of power ge generation equipment, a lot of other equipment, oftentimes in competition with the, the Japanese. Um, uh, China is actually a relatively, uh, certainly a very low cost and relatively effective builder of infrastructure. There are sometimes quality questions involved in the, the ultimate project, but if you want something built relatively cheaply and quite quickly, Chinese infrastructure construction teams are, are very good and in fact have won many international contracts. China. China. Um, ICT equipment, but not telephone network equipment, is a, a U.S. specialty. Uh, really, the alternatives to Huawei are Samsung and Nokia, and one other Nordic, I can't remember. Um, so, and in addition, there's just a lot of interest among countries in the region, Japan, Australia, uh, Korea, India, in cooperation in meeting the regional infrastructure demands. Um, want me to do? I can just add a tidbit. Um, I mean, I think that there is a general openness to cooperating and partnering directly with Korea on infrastructure assistance. There's initial conversations happening with my agency in Korea, with you know the DFC, um, and so there. Uh, Korea does have a, a relatively new entity, about a couple of years old, that is doing infrastructure financing as well as project preparation, which is similar to what USTDA does. And so we are in the brainstorming mode, I guess, um, in terms of how to cooperate. It is a relatively new entity, so um, they're likely uh, to continue to grow that. And so I would expect that there would be opportunities in the future of, of more cooperation with, with Korea. Just to add briefly, so it is called New Southern Policy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> New Southern Policy. Right. Yes. And, and just very quickly on TPP. Mm -hmm. um, not joining TPP was a huge loss for the United mm -hmm. States. Was a huge loss for the United States. Uh, right. Uh, both in terms of commercial opportunities but also in terms of strategic presence in the region. I knew a lot of people who were involved in the TPP negotiations and starting in late 2015 and throughout 2016, there was just this increasing sense of doom about the TPP negotiations because after two decades of very severe trade adjustment in the United States. It was just a bridge too far at the time. Um, I th think the outcome was independent of the 2016 presidential election. Um, given the challenge from Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton's response, I think it would have been very difficult to impossible for a Clinton administration to join the TPP. Um, certainly when Donald Trump was elected, it, it became impossible. But the United States left an awful lot on the table when they pulled out of TPP. I'll just say, um, for TPP, it was, it was sort of a trade-off. Um, I think if you talk to people who focus more on foreign policy, they would have said the United States should have joined TPP on day one to send a signal to China that look you're being you're being cut out right so we're we're gonna we're gonna go on without you um, and we're gonna we're gonna show you that your industrial policies aren't what the rest of the world wants right if you talk to some more economists they kind of start pulling back on that uh, they say TPP wasn't necessarily as efficient as we think it's not it wasn't the gold standard of trade deals that everyone kind of put it up to be um, at least from a, a free trade point of view. Um, trade standards maybe, but not from a free trade point of view. And so it doesn't necessarily 
it didn't necessarily do enough to address things like state-owned enterprises and subsidies. Um, if you look at countries like Vietnam and, Indi and Indonesia who are members of TPP, even they now have some exemptions from some of their standards, um, which they, the me other members don't have to dispute, can't dispute for a couple of years. And so um, there's a bit of a trade-off there. Uh, and so I think really your opinion of TPP really depend on which one of those camps you're coming from. Um, for cooperation in, in third countries, certainly there's, there's opportunity. And I, I think the United States is trying. Other countries who are investing, like Japan um, and like Taiwan, are, are looking for these opportunities. Problem is, they're just, you're, you're kind of, you have to wait and see. Um, you know, there's, it's finding the right opportunities is, is itself a, a task. And, and making sure that it's you know, profitable and that there is actually a, a, a a necessity for it, uh, not just because it, you know, someone wants a port, you have to kind of provide economic reasoning for why they need a port. So. Thank you. Any? And then we'll take two questions from the lady too. Hello, uh, my name is Harjop. Uh, I'm a digital democracy specialist uh, at the International Republican Institute. Um, I just have two quick short questions. Um, on the digital connectivity cybersecurity objective, um, it would be great if we could just hear a little bit more elaboration on what the interagency collaboration entails. Uh, and then secondly, it was interesting, the point brought up about MIT and some other collaborations focusing on procurement and cost effectiveness. I'm curious, are there any other initiatives uh, reaching out to Silicon Valley or reaching out to tech companies in that regard uh, to improve the way that we look at the digital technology from development space. And then on the flip side, um, I know we've been talking about investment infrastructure in Indo-Pacific, but what uh, kind of dawns on me is that unlike the cooperation collaboration that's happened with our European allies, I do feel like there is uh, a bit of disagreement, a bit of difference in approach and so I wanted to hear, are there any lessons learned or any interesting insights on trends in the way that we're actually cooperating or trying to cooperate, the US, I mean the US, um, with, for example, the Quad or other countries in Indo-Pacific? Um, and like, what are some potential agreements? What are some disagreements right now that we need to overcome? Why don't we answer him, his question first and then come back to you? Or, okay, related? Okay, please. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, so we're like, definitely on the same wavelength. Uh, I'm Rosalind Reicher, I work with McClarty Associates in the Asia practice there. Um, I'm, I'm just curious how uh, USTDA and other agencies involved in the interagency process and the DCCP feel that's been functioning and how the mechanisms for cooperation with the private sector uh, have been working out. Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, so I would say of the three initiatives from my personal perspective, I think the DCCP has been the most proactive in terms of um, you know, interagency collaboration. Uh, we all report on different ICT projects that we're focused on. Um, we have come to conclusions of the countries that we should be focused on. Um, there have been a number of focus groups that the State Department has organized um, with US industry high levels bringing Silicon Valley to DC to discuss with them on prioritizing areas where we should be most focused on. The collaboration and sort of the investments uh, take a variety of forms. I mean, a lot of it is focused on training. A lot of it is focused on, um, you know, bringing delegations here um, to help them, you know, understand US technology and expertise in this space. Um, you know, a lot of it is some of the work that we do where we're um, also, you know, we worked with Cisco to beat out some of the competition, for instance, in the Philippines for you know, a $100 million project um, beating out you know, significant East Asia competition, which we were really pleased to see for subsea cables. There's been a lot of focus on uh, 5G development and how to support efforts there. Um, again, cybersecurity is a big part of that. So I think anything, and, and then smart cities as well that we've talked about significantly. And I think it's a um, it's been a great platform. Again, it's been weekly calls with the interagency to understand what everybody is doing, where more uh, additional resources may be needed. The, the State Department has also reallocated a significant uh, amount of its funds to appropriate now for uh, the DCCP. 
or new training programs um, along those lines as well. Um, and I think just on your question in terms of has there been outreach in to Silicon Valley, the answer is yes. Um, so we, we will bring uh, what we call reverse trade missions as part of USTDA as well to Silicon Valley very often, um, usually focused on anything smart, <laughs> smart grid, smart transportation. Um, cloud computing has been a big one. I just got back from Manila a week ago. Uh, where we signed a grant for, uh, with the central government for cloud computing uh, for a center of excellence. We're very excited for that because that's actually going to include uh, four top cloud providers here in the U.S. that will be part of the center of excellence in the Philippines as the entire government is moving to the cloud. And so talking about international best practices, having U.S. companies, which are the leaders in this, lead the way and be part of the center of excellence. Um, they were also very interested in procurement when I spoke to the procurement officials in Manila of how do you procure cloud services? I mean, this is a completely new area that they don't have legislation in place for. Mm -hmm. So we're working with them to provide you know, guidance on legislation that would allow some of these new dynamic areas um, to continue to grow. Um, I don't know if I have much to say on in terms of if we're seeing some disagreement in approach. Um, I mean, I think for the most part, we have been fairly aligned if you're talking about the quad in terms of priorities. Um, I think, you know, it's difficult, I think, to get con to consensus always um, when you're working even within one country. Um, <laughs> but I think for the most part, I think that there's a lot of, uh, one of the platforms has been focused on quality infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Everyone can agree that when you level the playing field and leveling it for everybody to play, we all benefit. And so thinking about it in terms of international best practices, when it comes to procurement um, is really the area that we've been focused on and so that has less areas or potential for disagreement um, when we're all on the same page on that front. I don't know if others have thoughts there. I'd probably just say I think you know we have to understand that a lot of our uh, investment in this area is pr still primarily private driven and so those private companies themselves have their own interests uh, to take into mind. So that's why you see a lot more investment in things like healthcare and insurance and not infrastructure sometimes. It just if you look at the grand total of FDI in the region. Um, so there's that, that sort of trade-off. I mean, everyone has their vested interests. It's just kind of um, making sure that they're aligned. Uh, and so uh, that, that can be the hurdle, I think, sometimes. My name is Esther Lee from State Department. Um, Rob, you mentioned that we have to make sure that we, um, to identify why we care about certain projects that are strategic. Um, I, I think it makes total sense for ports, for instance, because there are geopolitical implications. But for infrastructure projects where we might not care as much who invests in what, um, like which country invests in those projects, what kind of what set of criteria should U.S. government use to define what's strategic for us um, to really invest? Um, and yeah, that's it. Well, um, that is the key question, and it's it's I mean, as as I was writing down the notes for my presentation, this was a, an issue that was easier to define than it was to describe and outline the considerations. Um, I mean, it strikes me that the, the criteria are clear strategic military use, which is why ports fell in that category. Um, uh, sort of cybersecurity issues and espionage issues, which is why you tend to care about telecommunication systems. Um, I mentioned lock-in. Uh, it's, it's really an issue of are you giving up alternatives? Are you uh, exposing yourself to influence or pressure by certain choices? Or all there are, are there alternatives that are maintained? And, and that's the one that I'm trying in my own thinking to define more carefully. I don't know whether Yeah, I mean, I think generally, you know, if we consider the immediate military implications, um, that that's usually, I guess, the, the top down, right? Um, 
then you can go into things like telecommunications and then energy. Basically, if you think of just the you know, the worst case scenario and kind of go in order of effect, like what, what affects people the most, and the second, and the third. And so that's why you tend to get these um, you know, emphasis is on transportation and then energy and telecommunications. <laughs> So, uh, right. so your question is, how can the U.S. kind of compete for these unbankable projects? Yeah. That are strategic. That are strategic. Yeah, um, I mean, that can be difficult. I mean, you're, you're finding incentives, and then what happens if countries game the system? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think at that point, it, it's, it's difficult. I think, again, there's, there's so many variables, right? There, there are the immediate strategic implications, but then there's also sort of the, the regional, the local implications as well. I mean, so what kind of influence do we already have there? Um, and then just going down from that, um, uh, I mean, just, I mean, you have to go into ownership type. So that's, that's, what's the worst case scenario of um, China building a new port off the coast of Sri Lanka for, for no reason? Um, is that really a strategic case? I mean, you talk about the one that they already sort of own, right? Hematoya, right? So we talk about that one a lot. If they built a new one, would it, would it translate into the same issue? Maybe not. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot of different factors, I think, to take into consideration. Um, I don't know if you guys want to hypothesize around. <laughs> it, it, it's a good question, right? If, if non-economic projects sort of add to external debt and don't really support growth. So they, they increase the, the indebtedness, the possibility of debt distress of the country. Um, Non-bankable projects with strategic implications. It's a more interesting question. And again, it raises Hamba Tota because the Sri Lankan government had actually shopped that project to a number of countries before uh, the Chinese financed it. And the reaction that they got was, look, you've got a port in Colombia, Colombo rather, uh, you've got excess capacity. We, we don't really see the economics of the Hambad Toda port. Uh, the Chinese financed it. Uh, the economics, well, actually probably a lot of reasons why Sri Lanka ran into debt difficulties and had problems paying it. And the problem there, I think, it, is it feeds a suspicion, maybe true, maybe not, that the original uh, motivation for the project on the part of the Chinese was strategic and was a desire to uh, ultimately have uh, military use of the asset. Um, that. I mean, whether true or not raises suspicions in the United States and uh, makes it more difficult for the Chinese and for us and for borrowing countries to, to tap what otherwise is uh, available finance. I think Esther and I are often in the same meeting. <laughs> I, think we, you know, I think we are racking our heads against this problem. I mean, oftentimes, as Bob mentioned, it's you know, these ports that have significant levels of debt. And who, can, who is going to volunteer to take that on? It's very difficult. Um, you know, we can do our share of assessments to try to think of you know, how to make it multi-use or how to transform it to be something that would be economic. But it's incredibly difficult, other than, you know, as you mentioned, we just buy out the loan, um, you know, what are the options? And it's, we have limited options, unfortunately. It's a, it's a tricky question. Now, I'll actually go even further with, the, I think, probably the least um, popular answer is sometimes there's, I mean, honestly, nothing you can do other than just sort of react to it. There's nothing direct that you can do, but you sort of analyze the new environment and respond to that. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, telecommunications development throughout Southeast Asia the fact that Huawei is in a lot of those areas, uh, well, there's not much we can do short of just ripping up the cords and laying down our own infrastructure, which 
theoretically we could do, but we're not going to do. <laughs> um, so it's just sort of responding to that environment and understanding that we have to work within that least secure environment now. Thank you. I, yeah, we have one more question from Hi, my name is Audrey. I'm from CSIS. Um, I'm just, I'm just curious about you talk about smart cities, and I know in Asia, um, most Asian countries don't have a very comprehensive laws and f digital infrastructure. I was just wondering how you go around that, and do you work with like local governments or like local advisory firms? And I was just curious about that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think it depends on the city, and we try to work with cities that are more proactive. Um, you know, some of our work in Ho Chi Minh City, for instance, um, the mayor has been has laws in place that allow us to do work there um, on emergency communications or intelligent transportation or operation centers, for instance. Um, so we, you know, I think in situations we have worked in cities where the laws that this is a new concept again. Um, and we do try to work at the local level as those decisions are going to be made there. Um, a lot of times our studies will actually include um, recommendations for how, for legislation, um, what regulatory environments would be conducive for smart city growth, what legislation would need to be changed. Um, this again isn't done by the U.S. government, it's by U.S. firms um, that we contract. And so um, oftentimes, especially in the smart city context, um, that is a task that's included in the assessment that we do. So rather than work around it, we try to work with them to try to get to them to a point um, for smart city development. I guess this is the point at which I'll be the old and grumpy <laughs> panel member. Um, a lot of what um, developing countries, a lot of what a lot of country needs are dumb city infrastructure. They're water, sewage, city streets, street repair, uh, the, the kind of public infrastructure that um, may never be financed privately, uh, certainly is not sexy and innovative, and, and yet is essential to the welfare of, of developing countries and rapidly growing developing countries because they're going to become increasingly urbanized. Um, so that's, that's one grumpy comment. The second grumpy comment is that we, we tend to focus on projects and on new investments rather than on infrastructure services and providing services most efficiently. The thing that almost always gets left out of these kinds of discussions, while mentioned it, is maintenance uh, and repair, which you know, tends to be neglected um, politically, uh, economically, because it's hard to fund maintenance, but in terms of offering services at, at least cost, uh, it's almost always underprovided. And I may just build on that briefly. On I think Bob's absolutely right in terms of um, the way we've tr approached smart cities is often with a master plan that looks at all of the projects and so that they're not separated. But a lot of it is sort of dumb infrastructure, as you put it, that now have smart elements. So when we're looking at water, and the water utility, they do need to have some smart elements and smart meters to measure, um, you know, make sure that they're keeping the revenue that they have, electricity. And so I think a lot of it is, it's combining, it's things that we've done for the last 20 years that now has a smart <laughs> in front of it. <laughs> um, but I think it's having a comprehensive plan and working with the city of, okay, we're gonna focus on water first, then we're gonna move to the grid, then we're gonna move to their rapid bus transport system. So. Um, I think that they're, you know, having its steps and making sure that the maintenance is built in is, is really critical too. And, and that's a completely fair point. Um, so. Thank you. Um, any more questions or other than that, um, I thank you very much again for this great panelist and um, I mean, Myself as a moderator, I have learned a lot and I hope you also enjoy this session and discussion and uh, we will come back to you with the second set of this roundtables, I mean, public event series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.